How are you? Nice to see you again. How is everybody? I don't know if I feel enough energy in the room. Because you can't just wait for this guy to come out. So I'm, I'm so, so, so happy to be with you here today. Um, you're probably wondering who this old guy is on stage compared to that young guy that was, was on, on the film there. But when I see, uh, when I see him, it always it makes me both so happy and so sad at the same time um, because I miss him. He, I remember once he said to me, we used to take these long walks when we were out in the trans sky, and he said, you know, Richard, many people love me from afar. Not many people love me from up close. I loved him from up close, which was the greatest privilege of my entire life. And I just want to tell you a little bit about him. Um, and I, there's a favorite story that I want to tell you. So I worked with him, as you saw in the video, on, on Long Walk to Freedom. And at the time we were working on the book, he was writing the Constitution of South Africa, and he was running for president of South Africa. And he wanted to go down and campaign. How many people are here from South Africa? Fantastic. Amandla. So, anyone from Natal? So, I see. So, he wanted to go down and campaign in KwaZulu Natal, where he wasn't so popular. And Everybody advised him not to go, and he really wanted to do it. And we, we were going to fly down there, and he had a tiny little plane with just two seats in it. So he got on the plane with his bodyguard, a guy named Mike. Tiny little propeller plane, and I went down to the airport in Natal, waiting for him, because then we were going to go to the rally. So about halfway down through the flight, um, I got a phone call from the people at the airport saying, um, that, actually I'm going, to tell the, I'm going to tell you from Mike's perspective. So Mike was on the plane, and he told me about this afterwards. About halfway down, Mandela was just sitting there reading a newspaper, and he loved reading newspapers because he wasn't allowed to read newspapers during 27 years in prison. And they're sitting across from each other, and then Mike felt a little tap on his knee, and he said, Mike, you might want to tell the pilot that the propellers are not working. So Mike, by the way, this was maybe his first flight ever, and he just walked over to the cockpit, and he said, hey, Mandela says the, the propellers are not working. And the, and the pilot said, yes, we know. One of them is working, one of them is not. You usually can land the plane safely, but we've called ahead. There's ambulances there. They're putting foam on the runway. <laughs> Everything should be OK. So Mike went back. He explained this to Mandela, and you saw how Mandela, you know, he had that face. Sometimes he was smiling, sometimes he was frowning, and he just listened very calmly. He said, very good, very good, and went back to reading his newspaper. So Mike later told me that, you know, he, he could barely sit still. You know, he was petrified, and he said the only thing that kept him calm during the flight, the only thing that kept him calm during the flight was that he would look at, at Nelson Mandela reading the paper so calmly, and that just made him calm. So lo and behold, the flight lands. Everything was fine. They didn't need to use the foam or the ambulances. Mandela got off the plane. There happened to be a busload of Japanese tourists there. And again, if you know Nelson Mandela, he has to say hello to everybody and shake every hand. And he bounded off the plane, smiling, you know, laughing, shaking hands with all of these Japanese tourists. It took like 20 minutes. We were late for the rally, and then I was waiting in this, this black armed iron BMW that we were, we were in, and he finally shook the last hand. He came in, he sat down next to me, and he turned to me and he said, man, I was terrified up there. <laughs> so. What that reminded me of is, during all these interviews we used to do, he would tell me, and in the beginning it always amazed me, he said, I was frightened. When I first went to Robben Island and the guards threatened me, I was frightened. 
you know, when, uh, when I had to meet with the government, I was frightened. And I remember thinking, this is Nelson Mandela telling me that he's frightened? How could Nelson Mandela be scared? And I asked him that one day. And he said, Richard, it would be irrational not to be afraid. He was a very rational man. And that taught me one of the great lessons of leadership that he teaches everybody, is that there is no courage without fear. Without fear, there is no courage. That what he had to do time and time again during his entire life was to sublimate that fear, because he knew he had something more important, and he couldn't let people see it. He had to turn it into something else, turn it into his vision for what he wanted to do. And all of his life, he kept one great goal in front of him. That goal was freedom for his people, one person, one vote. And he, he used to make a distinction between strategy and tactics. Have you heard of that distinction before? Strategy was the principle. Tactics was how, how you got there. And he kept that one principle of freedom of democracy, but how he got there, he was willing to compromise. And that is a lesson for all of you, is to keep your principles in front of you, but be practical how you get them. So he would be so happy to see you. He's smiling from somewhere today. He was a devout believer, a devout student of leadership, but a, a devout student of African leadership. So. You know, he, I mentioned there that he was from this little town in the Transkai, Mkwekazeni. And one of the things that people, that you read about him all the time, which I know is not true, is people say, well, he was from a royal family. He was an African aristocrat. He was a natural aristocrat, but he wasn't an aristocrat by birth. His father was a headman appointed by the British. And he was also the counsel for the king of the Tembu tribe, Jongataba. And when Nelson Mandela's father died, when he was 12 years old, his mother sent him to live with the king because he was the son of the council. And he became best friends with the king's son, a young man named Justice. But what that did for him was it educated him in African leadership, in the history of African leadership. He heard stories about the great leaders from the 15th and 16th and 17th century. And he observed the king, whom he greatly admired. And I used to sit in on meetings with him. This is before he was president, when he was talking with his, his group of, of leaders. And you know, he's an incredibly powerful, charismatic person. But, and I would sit in the meeting and not say anything, but he would, he would let every person talk before he said anything. He was always the last to speak. And when he spoke at the end, it was about summarizing what he had heard before and trying to find some consensus from what everybody said. That, to him, was African leadership. That was what was different, in part, about African leadership than Western leadership. Because he used to observe the king doing this. The king would listen to all of his counselors without speaking and then summarize what was said. Mandela did that himself, because consensus was so important. Remember when he came out of prison, he talked about the ANC as being a collective, that I am a, a loyal servant of the ANC and a loyal servant of the people. He really was. He saw himself as a representative of this organization and of those people. And I think I'm so pleased that you've all been here. I hope there are things about America and American leadership that you've learned. But I think also Americans need to learn from African leaders, too. They need to learn from a sense of consensus as well, which is something that we don't always see in our politics. So he would be... So, so he would be delighted to see you. And he really believed, and I think you are the emblems of this, you're a thousand points of light. There is an, a, there's a renaissance of African leadership going on now. And you are the representative of that. He would be so proud of you, but you have a responsibility too. You have to lead. As he would say, quoting somebody else, and this is relevant not only for Africa, but for America, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men 
and good women to do nothing. That's relevant to all of us and relevant in America as well. So um, I want to thank you, and I just want to say on that leadership note, so when, he, when I left working with him, it wasn't the last time I saw him, but, um, but I felt like the sun had gone out of my life. He was an incredibly sunny character. But I have to say that seeing all of you here, I feel like the sun has come back into my life and in the life of Africa. And so go back and lead. Thank you.